Luca Joe here. Today I'll be doing a playthrough video based on gameplay and strategy articles written for the game by the game's designer. The game is Hunt for Blackbeard, currently in GMT's P500. The designer is Volko Runke. This is a manhunt game where one player takes control of the hunters seeking to capture or kill the notorious pirate and the other player of course represents Blackbeard trying to avoid capture while performing his nasty deeds and living a pirate's life. This game uses a double blind system and therefore it is not suited for solitaire play. Fortunately, Volka posted two detailed articles about the game at the Inside GMT blog. These articles show how the game is played and also discuss the various strategies and challenges facing each player. Volko also kindly facilitated me with materials with which I assembled a pre-production copy of the game for these videos. This video will follow the first of two articles mentioned before, Hunt for Blackbeard, a peek at play. And we begin right now. Maestro Pancaldi. Much of Hunt for Blackbeard is a game of intelligence gathering for the hunters and how not to be seen for Blackbeard. A shared main map board holds shifting traces of Blackbeard's activities that the pirate hunters might discover and will be the scene for any combat between the hunter and the hunted. But the cat and mouse interplay derives from decisions logged within each player's area hidden behind a screen. Here we present a snapshot of play, each player's hidden game mat, as it would appear at the same moment mid-game. We won't be able to explain everything going on and every detail or how things got there, but we will run deeper than the wave tops in our hope to confide rather than confuse. And to help illuminate the history in the game, we will present situations that mimic closely or roughly the actual course of events in late 1718. A full game of Hunt for Blackbeard lasts at most four turns, and players begin each turn drawing some random tiles, and these drawn tiles are the game's clock. The Blackbeard player each turn draws one Acts of Piracy tile and one Pirate's Life tile, adding them to respective rows on a hidden player's mat. We see from Blackbeard's mat that it is turn three because three gray and three white tiles have filled in the two rows at the lower left, and each fourth tile remains to be drawn. Blackbeard's objective is to fulfill the opportunities and obligations represented by these piracy tiles. Blackbeard commits his time and effort via five black pawns. By placing pawns on the tiles and then sailing to the places named on them, he adds gold cubes. If Blackbeard, at the game's end, has filled at least half the gold squares of all the tiles in either row, he wins. That is, of course, if the hunters have not captured 
or killed him first. Here we are near the beginning of turn three. Blackbeard has yet to make this turn's moves. We see that Blackbeard has chosen to maintain his reputation through acts of piracy, rather than by living it up in a pirate's life. The player is ignoring the white pirate's life tiles and has concentrated on the upper row of gray acts of piracy tiles. Blackbeard is on track. In turn one and turn two, he filled four of the six gold boxes on the tiles drawn to that point. Blackbeard entirely filled turn one's seize prize at sea tile, yielding a loot marker worth one gold cube and adding that plus a bonus cube to his purse. Many tiles require cubes to come from Blackbeard's purse, so it's always a good idea to keep something jingling there. The game starts with Blackbeard having already taken one loot and in possession of a purse of five cubes. Blackbeard gets five actions per turn marked by five black pawns. The red outlines here show you which five actions the Blackbeard player took in the previous turn, turn two. Blackbeard prepared a defense in case the hunters show up. He spent one pawn, representing his time and effort, and one gold cube from his purse, which is his money, to ready a master gunner for his crew. On the chart, a nautical term for map, we see that Blackbeard sailed his sloop from his camp at Ocracoke Island into West Pamlico Sound and then to Bath Town. This move of two spaces cost two pawns. Blackbeard's purpose was to reach Bath so that he could divvy with Eden, that is, split some booty with the reputedly corrupt governor of North Carolina. In game terms, that means to place cubes on that piracy tile. Those actions left two of five pawns to plan piracy at the locale that he reached. As no pirate hunters interfered, two pawns on divvy with Eden which names Bath and Queen Anne's Creek as eligible locations, added two cubes from the purse to the tile. So far, so good for Blackbeard. But a few complications now rear their heads. The hunters are out there, of course, and one of them just showed up in North Carolina. Captain Brand is leading a no doubt well-armed overland party south from Williamsburg, Virginia. He has shown up in Queen Anne's Creek. This is near the top of the chart. Blocking that locale for piracy and, importantly, looming a short ride away from Blackbeard's current port of call at Bath. The hunter's player moves his pieces onto the main map board. And the Blackbeard player has marked Brand's new location as shown here. Moreover, both Turn 3's piracy tiles are inconvenient. Kareen's sloop may only be filled at a secluded anchorage, not in a town, and not until the turn after any sailing. So, this new Acts of Piracy tile is out of bounds until at least the fourth and final turn. Buy rum on the lower row comes with a penalty until filled. The crew is sober, grumbly, and perhaps starting to desert or talk about mutiny. Blackbeard gets just four of the usual five pawns this turn, probably too late in the game to switch efforts from acts of piracy to pirate's life. Any attentions to rum will distract from the piracy that needs to get done to win. We arrive then at a fine time. What do you think Blackbeard should do? Let's look at the alternatives. With four pawns, Blackbeard could both complete his divvy with Eden and see to the need to buy rum to thereby retrieve his fifth pawn for the final turn. The hitch with that, he would have to stay put in Bath Town. His prepared defenses 
just one of six maximum, remain unimpressive. Brand, having found nothing in Queen Anne's Creek, can be expected to move on to the busy capital at Bath, seeking Blackbeard's arrest. Another alternative, perhaps divvy for two pawns, and use the remaining two pawns to prepare lookouts to better escape Brand, plus another defense. Another alternative, to cut bait on Bath Town and sail back to camp, or another anchorage, ready to careen the sloop in turn four and hope that the final act of piracy tile is not too onerous a calling, two or perhaps three gold boxes rather than four. We will forgive your response, it's hard to say. Even aside you're not having all the game details at hand, the Blackbeard player can only surmise, not know how much the hunters already ken of the pirate's whereabouts, or what they may discern of his intentions. Those royal sloops could arrive at any time, almost anywhere, well armed or perhaps not, well informed or perhaps not. Let us sit aside what we know of poor Blackbeard's conundrum, get up and walk around to the hunter's side of the table. They have been busy too. Let's have a look now at their hidden area as of early turn three. Like Blackbeard, the hunters have been arming their forces and advancing them towards their objectives, but the hunters also have been gathering information to guide them to their human target. The hunter's player draws just one random tile each turn, an informant. These informants might be enemies of Blackbeard or enemies of those who harbor him in North Carolina, or just passers-by who have seen or heard something of the colony's notorious guest. At the outset of each turn before Blackbeard and then the hunters move, the hunters player may commit pawns to interviewing any face-up informants, that is, informants drawn at random and not already questioned on an earlier turn. Each pawn allows the player to inspect one face-down marker on the main map that may show the location of Blackbeard's sloop or its recent passage or the permanent site of his pirate's camp. We see that the hunters previously interviewed both the turn one and turn two informants, as it happens, each on the turn that they were drawn, though that is not required. Each of those tiles is flipped over, logging that they are used up as sources. On the hunter's chart, the player has recorded the results of these interrogations, plus of any tactical scouting done by forces arriving on the scene. The player has put various red-rimmed markers on the chart to form an intelligence picture. Blue blanks show where nothing was found. Blackbeard's flag, as you might have guessed from Blackbeard's chart before, show the recent passage of Blackbeard's sloop, and reports of the sloop herself can be seen. Of some great moment, the hunters invested four of their seven pawns on turn one to interrogate the rather well-informed ex-pirate quartermaster, William Howard. That allowed the player to select and inspect four anchorages, in this case islands, where the Blackbeard player is often tempted to set camp. The hunters located the camp at Ocracoke before Blackbeard had made his first move. See Ocracoke Island, near the top center of the chart. A red sloop marker there at the camp shows turn zero. Blackbeard's sloop has not yet moved wherever it might on turn one. The timestamp shows the date of the information. The other three anchorages inspected, Core Banks, Roanoke Island, and Knott's Island show blanks. Nothing was there. Whenever the hunters use informants, 
they may surveil any one space just secretly spotted at no extra cost in pawns. If they do, they place a surveil marker at that space on the main map where the Blackbeard player will see it and flip the marker there face up. The surveillance keeps markers in that space face up for the turn, so the hunters will be able to observe what happens there on Blackbeard's move. But the hitch is that the close surveillance will alert the Blackbeard player that the hunters are interested in that spot and are watching. In our playthrough, the hunters might be tempted now thus to surveil the Ocracoke pirate camp but the player decides not to do so, so as not to let on that the camp is already discovered. Note that the record markers on the hunter's chart have no direct impact on play. Their purpose is as an aid to the hunter's player as a reminder what is known when. The camp's site at Ocracoke is not all that the hunters know by the start of turn three. Remember that Blackbeard on turn one seized a prize at sea off Cape Hatteras. This means that his sloop stopped a merchant vessel and did piratically make away with its cargo. Such a crime does not go unnoticed. There is another effect of filling the last gold box on such a piracy tile with a cube. Besides reaping the pirates their loot, the Blackbeard player must flip over the face-down marker on the main map of the locale of the act of piracy, and it must show either a flag that Blackbeard was there, or Blackbeard's sloop itself. In this case, it was a flag because Blackbeard had sailed back to Ocracoke. The hunter's player, therefore, has accordingly Mark Hatteras with a turn one flag. More detail on Blackbeard's whereabouts and a sign that he intends acts of piracy, most of which must occur out at sea, rather than a pirate's life inland. Eager to bring forces to bear on Blackbeard while all that information is fresh, the hunter's player spent remaining pawns on commandeering assets to better equip the two hunter sloops and Captain Brand's expedition and then sending them on their way from Virginia. The hunters used the remaining three of their seven turn one pawns, after interviewing Howard with four, to staff Sloop Jane with the dashing Lieutenant Maynard and extra hands, these are red tiles, and to reinforce Bran with an extra contingent under Captain Gordon, the blue tile. Just like Blackbeard preparing defenses, the hunters must use a pawn per commandeered asset tile, though they never have to worry about paying from any purse. The Royal Navy's authority and Virginia's wealth are ample. Turn two brought the hunters a second informant, condemned pirates, who can be interviewed to spot in any one space. These Crewmen of Blackbeard's erstwhile pirate flotilla only know a little, but that might be about anything. You just have to ask them the right questions. The hunter's player immediately interviewed condemned pirates for one pawn to inspect the ocean space off Gun Inlet, where they found nothing, and therefore the blank one marker. Why Gun Inlet? The player's idea was to bound the search problem, but confirming or ruling out that Blackbeard, after taking the prize off Hatteras, had sailed north. This negative information, a dog that did not bark, now makes it much more likely that Blackbeard remains within the southern half of the map area. The modest investment in talking to informants leaves six hunter pawns for the turn. The hunters use two of them to commandeer local pilot master William Butler, an extra hands for Ranger. Three more pawns sail the two sloops to Cape Henry where they will wait for Brand to be in position further south and march Brand through Albemarle County to Queen Anne's Creek 
with these movements, the hunters have essentially committed to the form of their expedition. Assets that affect specific pieces, red, white, pink, and blue, are only to be had on friendly ground back home in Virginia. Forces may return north for them, but there rarely is enough time for such reversals, of course. These hunters in our campaign are only moderately equipped. The until recently civilian sloops have no cannon, for example, which must be separately commandeered. Blackbeard's pirate sloop adventure does have cannon and perhaps fancier armament. After completing all sailing and marching for the turn, the hunters get to spot each space on the main map containing their pieces. In this case, that means Brand at Queen Anne's Creek. This on-the-scene reconnaissance must be open, that is, the Blackbeard player sees where these forces are on the shared main map, and the marker there is simply flipped face up. Brand reveals Queen Anne's Creek to be empty. Of seven hunter pawns, one has been used to interview, two for assets and three for movement, leaving one for the turn. Once the hunter forces are on the main map in North Carolina, as Brand is now but Jane and Ranger not yet, they may scout one adjacent space each before and or after moving at the cost of one pawn per space. The hunters have kept their final pawn so that Brand may do so. Having found nothing at Queen Anne's Creek, Brand scouts Albemarle Sound to rule out the possibility that Blackbeard had slipped north via Roanoke Island. The hunters place a blank two in the sound as a reminder that Brand can continue south next turn as the likelihood now of Blackbeard putting into Queen Anne's Creek is low. Arriving at turn three, the hunters draw bumbo traders. These local merchants ply the many inlets and anchorages of the colony. Who knows what they may have spied. But time is running down. The hunters player does not want to spend more than a pawn on further interviews, because sailing, marching, and scouting are now called for to bring Blackbeard to heel. One hunter pawn, as shown here, goes to inspecting one sound. The hunter's player would like to see whether Blackbeard is or has moved between the camp on Ocracoke Island and the capital at Bath. After the act of piracy off Hatteras on turn one, there was no follow on seizure or raid on turn two. The hunter's player would have seen the Blackbeard player flip a marker up on the main map if any such act of piracy tile were filled in. That's a bit odd and raises the possibility that Blackbeard is pursuing agendas in the towns or in camp rather than on the sea. The hunters player would like a better basis to know whether to press Brand onto Bath Town or even towards Fishtown beyond. The hunter's player secretly inspects the main map marker at West Pamlico Sound and finds the flag placed there secretly by the Blackbeard player the previous turn, turn two, as Blackbeard sailed from Ocracote Camp to Bath. The flag represents a recent sighting of the sloop adventure and allows the hunters to follow that trail. The hunter's player may now immediately spot one space adjacent by water to the flag, again secretly. Blackbeard's intentions towards Bath Town being the issue, the player inspects there and spots adventure at dock. Interviewing occurs early in the turn, when the markers to be spotted are still those of last turn's activity. In effect, the informant's information is already a bit stale. The hunter's player marks these flag and sloop positions with turn two markers, since Blackbeard has yet to move in turn three. 
In the two-player game, Blackbeard's actions would occur behind the player's screen, and they would include secret resetting of the shared map. With the exception of revealing whatever occurred in Blackbeard's turn in a space being surveilled. Meanwhile, the hunter's player would ponder what to do next. As we showed before, the hunters have just spotted Blackbeard's sloop at Bathtown after revealing the flag at West Pamlico Sound. So, what should the hunters do next? Should they for free surveil bath town or should they hold back so as not to spook the pirate just as he is vulnerable to arrest by brand a second option could be after blackbeard's turn for just one pawn jane and ranger could sail together from cape henry to any ocean space these are the dark blue squares any inlet or hatteras they then could sail on for more pawns, either one pawn per adjacent space by water, using the light blue path, and they could do that together, or one pawn for each one of the sloops if they split up. Or, Brand similarly could march on by land, and that is using the brown paths, for one pawn per adjacent space. Wherever they end up on the main map, the hunters will spot that space, hoping to encounter Blackbeard's sloop. Brand might first scout again before moving, one pawn to spot one adjacent space. Each of the three pieces could scout after moving, one pawn each. So, see what move you can work out with six hunter pawns. How confident are you that you will find Blackbeard this turn? Or are you further limiting his options in hope of blocking his piracy and winning without a fight? There is still another turn to go and we have not yet considered the uncertainties of combat. Welcome to the hunt. And here we reach the end of this video. In the next video, we will follow the action based on the second article, Hunt for Blackbeard, Action on the Map. I hope this video series can give you a good idea of what this game is about, and I want to thank Volko Runke for his assistance in making this video series possible. So, this is Stuka Joe, signing off for you.